So I think we're now going to move on to the last session from the day, um, which is women and leadership. And it's my great pleasure to um, introduce um, Dame Professor Jane Dacre, who in the UK is a legend in terms of women in medicine. Um, she has a very long and distinguished career at UCL. She's been um, in charge of the medical school. Um, she um, has been the president of the Royal College of Physician, uh, Physicians, only the third woman to hold that position. She's been a ma made a dame of the British Empire. And she also has led recently on a review of women in medicine and the gender pay gap. And she's somebody who really champions women as leaders. So it's my really great pleasure to welcome Jane Dacre, who's going to um, tell us um, about when women in medicine and the gender pay gap. So over to you, Jane. Hello, I'm going to be talking about women in medicine and the gender pay gap. The three women in this photograph are the three women who have been the president of the Royal College of Physicians. That looks great. However, that's in 500 years. I have a conflict of interest, which is that I'm the chair of the Gender Pay Gap in Medicine Advisory Board for the Department of Health and Care in England. I'm going to be talking about the history of women in medicine, gender inequality in medicine, the gender pay gap, and also reducing the gender pay gap. Well, healthcare began in the home. Caring was a female responsibility until the medical royal colleges came about 500 years ago. From then on, physicians were men and women were thought to be unsuited. These two quotes are from 100 years ago. This one says, a woman as a doctor is a conceit contradictory to nature and doomed to end in disappointment to both the physician and the sick. And that was in The Lancet in 1878. This one says, women ought not to be encouraged to enter a profession for which they were constitutionally unfitted. And this was Sir Richard Douglas Powell, who was president of the College of Physicians. And that quote is next to Carol Black, who was the second female president of the Royal College of Physicians. There were some women who thought differently from this, but in those days, women did not knowingly accept women into medical school. The first women passed the exams incognito. And actually, when the Society of Apothecaries, another esteemed medical organization, discovered this loophole, they closed it. But by then, some women had already qualified and could work as doctors. The women in this slide were pioneers for women in medicine. The lady on the top left is Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. She was the first female doctor in this country. Next to her is her colleague, Sophia Jex Blake. The two of them together set up the first medical school in England. On the right is Elsie Inglis. She was a doctor in the Crimean War. And the anecdote about her is that she made Florence Nightingale look like a part-time care assistant by comparison. Perhaps one of my favourites is the lady underneath, Dr. James Miranda Barry. She was born Miranda Barry, but worked as James, became a physician, the physician, the surgeon general in the army. And it was only after she died that people realised that she'd been a woman all along. The lady in the middle in the red robe is Sheila Sherlock, who was one of the pioneers of hepatology and worked at the Royal Free. And next to her is Professor Dame Margaret Warwick, who was the first female president of the Royal College of Physicians. This was earlier in her career. I be first became gender aware in 2009 when I wrote a, uh, a, a paper on women and medicine, the future. And this was because there was concern that the number of women coming through medical schools in around that time meant that the profession would become female dominated and therefore would be weakened. You can see that in the top photograph there, myself and Carol Black are seeing sitting amongst a large number of males. If we fast forward to 2020, when I was still interested in women in medicine, and that's the year that this publication, Mend the Gap, the Independent Review into Gender Pay Gaps in Medicine, which I'm going to talk about a bit later, uh, came out. And there I am again, amongst a lot of Royal College presidents who are all male. 
Uh, I was appointed by the Secretary of State, Jeremy Hunt, to lead the Gender Pay Gap Review in England, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So I was reported, he said, because of my ability to speak truth to power. A lot of this came about because in 2016, during the Junior Doctors Industrial Action in England, he and I crossed swords several times. And uh, this meme here is from uh, Game of Thrones, where people thought that I was standing up to Jeremy Hunt, something I'm quite proud of now. Other things that were happening at the time suggested that women were not welcome necessarily in medicine. And, and the lady in this photograph is Daphne Romney, who recently did a report at the BMA showing that they had toxic masculinity. And the quote here is from Punch magazine. And you can see a lot of men sitting around a table and one woman. And the caption is, that's an excellent suggestion, Miss Triggs. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. Well, where are we now? If we look at current data from an NHS digital, 45% of hospital specialists are now women. All specialties have more women than 10 years ago. 77% of NHS employees are women and 44% of NHS chief executive officers are women. There has been a significant increase of women into UK medical schools from 1975 when the Sex Discrimination Act uh, suggested that it was, should be illegal um, to have fewer women than medicine and to have quotas. The quotas went, the number of women shot up, and it's now stabilised at around 60% to 40% in favour of women coming into our medical schools. Well, the reason for publishing Men to the Gap, the independent review into gender pay gaps in medicine was because during the junior doctor strike, there was some controversy about whether the imposition of the uh, new junior doctor's contract would disadvantage women. So that's the background behind my being asked by the Right Honourable Jeremy Hunt, who was then the Secretary of State for Health in England, to lead the gender pay gap review. Well, before talking about it too much, I want to just explain what a gender pay gap is. It's the difference between the average hourly earnings of men and women expressed as a percentage of men's pay. This is different from equal pay. Equal pay for equal work was enshrined in law in, 19, in 1970. A gender pay gap is something that goes on throughout someone's career. Well, for this piece of work, we had access to some fantastic data sets. We did a literature review, which include policy and legislative work on gender and pay. We had 30 in-depth interviews of men and women. We sent a survey to 40,000 doctors that were randomized from the GMC register. And we had access to large quantitative data sets from the NHS electronic staff record, from HESA for higher education data, where we couldn't find data we had access to the self-assessment tax returns. This was particularly for GPs. And we also had access to the UK Med database, which has data on trainee cohorts. So overall, we had data on 83,000 hospital doctors and 16,000 GPs. Well, what did the data show? It showed that there has been a steady reduction in the gender pay gap, with the total being around 16 to 17%. But this reduction is slow. As this graph goes up, the gender pay gap is reduced. The gender pay gap also peaks in the ages between 40 and 60 and starts to reduce at around the age of 65 to 70. So it's a, it's a peak problem at women's childbearing and caring ages. It isn't equal across the specialties and male dominated specialties like urology have bigger gaps in total pay. And I, I could ask you to guess who has the biggest gender pay gaps. And yes, you're right, it tends to be the surgical specialties. I looked up genitourinary medicine for the purposes of this talk and actually your pay gap is larger than you might think. Well, what what makes this pay gap up? If you look at the uh, so-called decomposition, which is a statistical technique looking at what contributes to the pay gap, you can see that a lot of the contributions are what are called endowments. And these are static things in society that people can't change. For example, women doctors at the moment are younger than men doctors. 
women doctors are more likely to work in less well-paid roles. If you look at the green part of this bar, it shows something called coefficients. And coefficients are things that uh, are likely to include discrimination against women. Well, the main contributors to the gap which you can account for are age, seniority of men, the specialty, part-time working, which even pro rata uh, accounts for some of the pay gap in women the gender balance in specialty, which I've mentioned, clinical excellence awards, ethnicity, and geography. Well, this is quite a hot potato, more so than I had thought. At various stages during my career, when I've been interested in gender, I've been invited to speak on the radio or in the media. Um, I managed to make a mistake and say only 11% of female clinical academics are women. This reached Private Eye, the satirical magazine, and I have to say has a bigger impact than nature when it comes to getting publicity for the cause. Well, what we need to do is reduce gender equality. How do we do this? There is still gender equality in medicine. If we reduce pay gaps, we reduce inequality. And if we reduce inequality, we will, as a result, reduce pay gaps. So I'm going to move on to talk about that. Well, one of the things we can do, and the results of our work have helped us to give an evidence base for this, is to support more women into senior positions, to have more women as role models, to have women as mentors and sponsors, and to have women influencing at senior levels and being champions of flexible working. This doesn't feel too difficult, but it's been very difficult to achieve. And the lady in the photograph here is Brenda Hale, who is a role model actually in the legal possession, profession. And that shows me that actually the problems are not only in medicine, they're across the board for women. Here are some role models in medicine. And I think you can see uh, we have Jane Anderson, who is a role model in HIV medicine in, in the middle there. But all of these women are contemporary women who are working in medicine at the moment and who are role models for others in, in medicine. Dame Carol Black, Dame Helen, Dame, Professor Dame Helen Stokes Lampard, uh, Professor Dame Carrie McEwen, Dr. Susie Lishman, uh, Professor Dame Parveen Kumar. These are all, all extraordinary women in medicine. And of course, last but not least, is Margaret Johnson, who introduced me today. Well, the gender pay gap came up with a series of recommendations. There are seven themes across which we have 42 recommendations. And the themes are to make senior jobs accessible and attractive to women to address system barriers to the progression of women, to increase transparency of pay in the medical workforce, to make changes that were previously nice to have, important to have mandatory changes, such as making sure that there are adequate numbers of women on shortlists for top jobs, to change the behaviors and culture and have a zero tolerance to the kind of inappropriate behavior that I talked about in the BMA earlier to work on clinical excellence awards. Clinical excellence awards uh, contribute around 20% to the gender pay gap. It's not a huge amount. However, it's part of the problem. And if clinical excellence awards were more equal, medicine would be more equal. Where I've put other areas of concern, one of the things that we'd like to do in those other areas is to have more open, open um, reporting of gender pay gaps, because what gets measured gets taken seriously. These are things that organisations can do to reduce gender inequality and reduce pay gaps. And you'll notice that those in the green um, are, that are effective actions are actually more difficult to do than those in the blue, which don't work very well. So if you want to reduce your gender pay gap, you need to have mandatory women on short lists. You need to have skills based assessments for jobs, structured interviews, salary negotiation needs to be transparent and 
transparency also in promotion, pay and reward for jobs, and diversity managers. Now, those are all things that some organisations are doing now, but not all. Unfortunately, a lot of the actions that organisations are taking to reduce gender inequality and gender pay gaps either have mixed results or don't work very well. Well, we've now set up a gender pay gap implementation advisory group, which I chair, and we are beginning to have an effect. I mentioned Clinical Excellence Awards earlier, and I'm very pleased to say that National Clinical Excellence Awards are now, now going to uh, no longer, that they're now going to be uh, paid in full, even though women work part time. This was something uh, that we fought for for some time and that the BMA and the trade unions have been for fighting for. Gender pay gap uh, measurements will feature in CQC report and will feature in the well-led domain. So trusts are less likely to be seen as well-led if they have a big gender pay gap. There are new contract negotiations and they're all referencing gender pay gap reduction as part of good practice. There will be regular reporting of progress and also there is a review of the ethnicity uh, pay gap and this is to address something called intersectionality because there are some people uh, that are women and also from a minority group and they have a very significant impact on their pay. In our own way, we've been running courses to try and support women leaders. Um, we are chipping away at this gender pay gap. This, we run a course at UCL and also the Royal College of Physicians and the Royal College of Surgeons. And these are three supporters of the course. Dr. Susie Lishman from the Royal College of Pathologists, uh, Lady Estelle Wolfson, who has funded the courses, and Dame Claire Marks, who is the uh, former president of the Royal College of Surgeons and also chairman of the GMC. And they are supporting courses run specifically to help women. Recently, these courses have been focused on, focusing on women from minority ethnic groups because, as I've said earlier, they have a bigger problem with gender pay gaps. There's also something called the Women Leaders Network, and this has done a piece of work working on gender balanced boards in the NHS. And they wrote a report called 5050 by 2020. Sadly, boards did not reach 5050 men and women by 2020, but there has been some progress. This organization also published a document called Men as Allies, reminding us that as women, we shouldn't be going it alone. We ought to be working with men as supporters to try and reduce inequality. The lady here is the chair of the Women Leaders Network, and she's called Samantha Allen. Well, one of the things that's really important about uh, working in gender is keeping your own um, self-respect. And this is my favourite quote in relation to gender equality and to feminism. People often ask me when I'm talking about gender whether I'm a feminist. And I refer to this, which is that I say I myself have never been able to find out precisely what feminism is. I only know that people call me a feminist whenever I express sentiments that differentiate me from a doormat. So I would say to every person in this room, be a feminist, be somebody that expresses sentiments that differentiates you from a doormat. Make sure that you look at the evidence and you use the evidence that we're collating to reduce inequalities for women in medicine and therefore to reduce the gender, pay the gender pay gap. Gender equality still exists in medicine, but as I've said today, women play an increasing role in medicine and that role will increase further, but we need to get more women to reach the top of the profession, like the three women, myself included in this photograph here. The gender pay gap will reduce, but at the moment it's reducing too slowly. We need to work on evidence-based actions to make it reduce more quickly. Because of the work that we've done in the gender pay gap review, we have the opportunity to make evidence-based change. We have a large number of organizations now working together on the gender pay gap, on equalities, to try and reduce that. And we're going towards having annualized reporting as a measurement of change 
because the measurement of a reduction in gender pay gaps is a measurement of a reduction in inequality for women. So I call on you to recognize that the time has come to embrace a new culture because the medical workforce needs its men and its women. Times are very difficult at the moment. There are all sorts of things going on. Now is the time to embrace gender and other kinds of equality so that we have the whole workforce working to the top of its game to help support our patients. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very, very much, Dame Jane, for that um, excellent um, and incredibly enlightening uh, talk. Um, we, we now have an opportunity to take questions from the audience, and I just, I'm just looking in the chat, and I've seen at the moment there aren't any questions. Um, perhaps, Margaret, do you have any questions to start, to start us off? So, Jane, I'm, thank you very much. As you know, um, I'm a great... Um, supporter of all the work that you've done around um, women in medicine. What about women in science? Is there a similar body of work that's looked at the opportunities in science for the, for, you know, for, and in, you know, other, you know, medical um, um, non-clinician, non-doctor um, groups? So um, one of the things that's been interesting about this work is that we've been able to do it very scientifically because of the UK's National Health Service. And the reason why we can look at these huge data sets is because people who work in health in this country tend to employ, be employed by a single employer. So there is, there is mandatory reporting for organisations that are uh, bigger, have more than 250 people, but um, you were not able to get that degree of strength of um, evidence from smaller organizations. And so uh, there is evidence that if you if you look at the, the gender pay gap data in um, organizations, particularly in science, there is a significant problem, um, but it's not, the data isn't as strong as with the NHS purely because the power is less. We had extraordinary power in the work that we did because there are so many people that work in the NHS. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe I'll ask you something else as well, which is, you know, clearly we've got a long, lot of young people. The great thing about this meeting is we have a lot of um, young scientists and clinicians um, as well as our patient population who um, sort of, um, uh, put in abstracts and give talks. And I think maybe just a little bit about how you grow into being a leader. I mean, you've yeah. been, you know, somebody who, you know, we can learn so much from. I mean, at what point did you, de you sort of decide to go from being, you know, just a clinical doctor into yeah, leading in medical education and then subsequently getting involved in you know improving healthcare um, and fighting the likes of um, um, the government um, I never I never intended to do it so that's the first thing but I did see a lot of things that needed to be sorted out and so what I uh, had tended to do was to see things that were really silly and could have been done in a, a much more effective and efficient way. And then I set about sorting them out and realized that uh, it's hard to sort out small, medium and large problems from a, a, a position where you don't have enough authority. So if you then are at the table and in a position of authority, you're more likely to be able to solve problems. So I never had a Churchillian instinct. I never wanted to be a world leader, but I did want to sort things out. Uh, I now know that that's a particularly female way of looking at leadership, that you just say, oh, this is ridiculous. Come on, there must be a better way of doing it. And that's what I've always done. I've looked around now for things that needed to be done better and um, have been sorting out, tidying up, getting things going, rather than being, right, I'm in charge. I want to be the boss because that just wasn't really my style. 
Thank you very much. So I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and ask you a couple of questions, if that's OK. Um, so along your journey, um, I'm sure you must have encountered a number of challenges. I just wanted you to perhaps speak on maybe two or three challenges that stand out for you and then how you solved them or how you dealt with them. Um so some challenges are to do with being the only woman at the table um and one of the difficulties there is feeling strong enough to be able to voice your opinion when actually you're likely to be in the minority mm -hmm. um one of the ways that that i found quite helpful to do that is to to, to find a friend in the room and to work out who might be on your side. And one of the things that's helped me overcome challenges with people uh, really maybe being aggressive or being unpleasant to me is to work the room. Mm -hmm. And I learnt those skills from um, being a medical educator. Mm -hmm. So dealing with a difficult group of a large number of people, for example, the council of a big organization, um, simple classroom skills are terribly helpful <laughs> in getting people on your side, getting the people who behave badly to behave a bit better um, and and to, uh, to to get what you need done going through. So so that's one challenge is which I which is that I would advise everybody um, who wants to go into leadership to learn some classroom skills because it's very helpful at uh, managing meetings. Then another, um, just a, a, a second one very quickly, yes. is being true to yourself. That if you think that something is really wrong and you have very strong views that something isn't right, then collect the evidence so that you're on safe ground and just gird your loins and speak up, um, which is not always easy. <laughs> In fact, not ever easy. Thank you very much. Those are incredibly uh, important uh, points. I've actually noted them down. I'm going to be using them from now on. <laughs> and uh, as we've been talking, we've actually have a, a comment and a question from the audience. I'm going to read the question first, and then I'll read the comment afterwards. So the comment, the question is from, oh, there are actually three now. Uh, the question is from Mel. And she says, how can we women living with HIV, how, 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 as women living with HIV, can we lead in the community, in leading community organizations, especially as we are now in the majority of people living with HIV? So I think being in the majority is a huge plus. And so what I would say is develop your networks, speak to your allies, uh, confide in what you might call the sisterhood, because together everybody everybody is stronger. Um, so, so where a community recognizes that it has a set of shared needs and it gets together and voices those needs, mm -hmm. In, in harmony, not necessarily singing with one voice, but in harmony like a choir, then you can make enormous progress. So sing together, I would say. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad you said that we actually belong to a choir called The Joyful Noise. So we're going to carry on singing together. Thank you so much. I have another comment, a um, couple of comments and then a question from Sharon. So the comment is from Annette. She says, I'm really grateful that you did not avoid to use the word feminism in your talk. There should be more, many more female and male feminists in medicine. So that's a comment from Annette. And then we have a comment from Lena. She says, it is important that we as women start talking more about our pay. We need more transparency in pay, and we also need to be advocates for ourselves and other women. It was after discussion like this at a previous meeting that I got motivated to face my employer and demand equalization in my pay, which was somewhat successful. And then we've got a question from Sharon. Oh, they're coming in now. Um, <laughs> one from Sharon, one from Angela, and another one from a, another comment. So question from Sharon says, um, the COVID pandemic has further shown that issues related to the, to the gender gap. Do you think that this will help or hinder issues related to gender inequality in, the, in medicine going forward? Um, so the answer to that is, is yes and no. 
Um, so when there were big lockdowns, the societal expectations on women meant that the responsibility for homeschooling kids who couldn't go to school fell almost exclusively on women. And during that time, men got on with writing papers in their studies upstairs and women got on with uh, looking after the children, homeschooling the children and making the suppers. So people reverted to the, the um, gender stereotypes. So that made things worse. However, something that's made things a lot better is conferences like this. So the enormous developments in IT and in flexible uh, ways of working has meant that organizations have recognized that presenteeism isn't necessarily the only way to do things and that you can actually work equally hard across time zones, um, sitting in your, in your living room and you can deliver just as much uh, as you might have been able to do otherwise. So it's not quite clear yet which of those is going to win. So when the children got back to school and we were still working from home, then there was a lot of catching up done in terms of, of people being able to work much more flexibly. And that is a huge plus for women working in, in any sector. But the difficulty is when the societal norms come in and the women are quite literally left holding the baby thank you very much and we have a question from Anjana Anjana I hope I've pronounced your name right um, thank you Dame Jane on your really inspiring talk I just wanted to get your opinion on whether women can have it all and she's got it in courts and provide advice that you would provide to women in healthcare stroke science on balancing family and work well I think the answer to that has got to be yes but in order to do that, we need societal change to welcome us uh, at the table and to support us to achieve what, what we're able to achieve. So I feel hugely privileged in, in my career. Uh, and I think possibly because I was just a bit stubborn, I have three children. I still have a husband. Uh, I have had a, a charmed career. I've been extremely lucky. Um, I've now got grandchildren and I am not giving up. And I feel a huge responsibility to show anybody in this conference that if you want to do this, you can do it. There should be nothing to prevent us from doing it. Now there are barriers, but they, we also have choices. So when there's a barrier in the road, you have a choice to go round it. So I would say be strong, be creative and try and get around those barriers because uh, having it all is great. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm going to finish with this comment from Lila, which I think echoes what a lot of us feel right now in the room. And then I'm going to hand over to Margaret to close the session. So Lila says, I have a, re a new role model. So do I. Thank you for being so inspiring. Thank you for this talk. Love it. Thank you very much, Dem Jane. And uh, over you to, Mar to Margaret. Well, just really, Dame thank you very much. I knew that you would inspire so many um, of the young people at the meeting here this evening. And as I know, you've inspired so many women in medicine um, and actually probably in women, you know, across all sorts of careers. So thank you for all the work that you've done really to promote women. And um, I'm sure that we're all very grateful to have you here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, just a quick mention now that the poster viewing session is going to start shortly. So please stay with us and uh, we, we, as we move into the poster viewing session. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you very much, Dame Jane. Thank you, Jane.